harried society of the 1920s. The idea of simply taking a break for refreshment and pleasure became more and more important. With the increased pace of modernity, you have to be a given place at a given time. So the notion of taking a break means that you take a break from what the established order is from nine to five. This was an area for personal expression, a break. And what better modern personal expression indeed than this most urban of beverages, Coca-Cola. The pause that refreshes, they called it, starting in 1929. It was one of the most successful and long-lasting slogans in the history of the brand. Just as important as the slogan were the visuals that went with it. The decades between the wars would become known as the golden age of American advertising art. And the best artists of the time were working for Coke, showcasing not only the modern scene, but an idealized America that was fast fading. Artists like Norman Rockwell and N.C. Wyeth portrayed Coke as an intrinsic part of life in the United States, past or present, a constant in a changing time. But the most lasting contribution of these ads to pop culture was also the most surprising, and it came at Christmas. The development and use of Santa Claus and, and advertising for Coca-Cola comes out of the fact that the winter months were not strong months for the sale of soft drinks, and for Coca-Cola specifically. They were trying to come up with an advertising concept that would link Coca-Cola to the winter months and very specifically to the holidays. The first ad showed a department store Santa refreshing himself with a Coke after his shift. Well, that's not what the head of advertising had in mind. And so the next year in 1931, Head and Sunbloom, who created our modern Dutch uncle, luminous, ruddy-cheeked Santa, made it the real Santa. Until then, Santas had come in all shapes, sizes, demeanors, and clothes. After Sunblom, Santa was always white-bearded, red-suited, jolly, and fat. And when he was interviewed on this subject, Sunblom said that uh, he made him the opposite of those depressing, depression-era street corner Santas that he saw around Chicago, who were always skinny old alcoholics standing on the street corner ringing bells, and that what he wanted to do was to create an image of happiness and abundance, and so his Santa was fat. That, too, is a way of reassuring people that the American holiday is going to continue to be one of benevolence and goodwill and abundance, even in hard times. The Christmas of 1931, that first brought the Coca-Cola Santa to the world, was a tough one for many Americans. The Great Depression had rolled across the land. There was little need for a pause in a country that seemed to have stopped dead in its tracks. Yet Coke sales stayed high. In tough times, people cling to the familiar, and Coca-Cola was certainly that. Hi there, fellas. Hi, Sam. Found a job yet? Not yet. Well, times is tough, all right. Yeah, I'll say. Two bottles of Coca-Cola. During the Depression, you could always call a fella and say, Larry, meet me down for Coca-Cola. I want to buy you a Coca-Cola. And you'd ask, uh, you, you know, you could always afford a five-cent drink. And that was the sign of good taste and friendship. Our lady luck was Coca-Cola. 
Stopping to have a Coke helped people remember a time when they had a job to take a break from. And Coca-Cola advertising continued to reflect the hopes and dreams of Americans. Hollywood stars, who were letting Americans escape at their local movie theater, also became reminders of how Coke could help people escape, too. There would be other trials in the decade to come, but the 1940s would see a defining moment for Coca-Cola. By 1941, the world had divided itself into two camps, one armed, the other unarmed. On the surface, life in the United States was going on as usual. But in 1941, there was an undercurrent of tension in the air across America. Anxiety that manifested itself, even in this promotional film that the Coca-Cola company released that year. Extra, extra, get your latest war extra. Read all about it. Extra paper. Have you seen the latest edition? I suppose you have. I suppose you feel pretty much as I do about it. Awful, isn't it? The headlines, I mean. Death, destruction, upheaval, unrest. It makes you wonder, makes you wonder what the world's coming to. Yes, sir. What's the world coming to? America's entry into the war put Coca-Cola in a curious bind. Gearing up for war production meant that more money was flowing and demand was rising. War also brought restrictions on vital materials that hit many businesses hard, including Coca-Cola. They had experience from the First World War where sugar had become a problem uh, in terms of syrup manufacture. So that was something that they were very much concerned about. There were even restrictions upon uh, what kind of materials we could use for advertising and kind of materials we could use for packaging. So instead of using metal for six-pack carriers, we were using wood. Many companies switched over to producing military goods. Car companies made Jeeps. Clothing manufacturers made uniforms. Lipstick makers churned out shell casings. This sort of switchover wasn't an option for Coca-Cola, but Coke did have a major ally as the war effort went into full swing. Its emotional ties to the American people, especially to the men who would be fighting the war. Suddenly cabbies, soda jerks, mechanics, and farmers found themselves on the battlefield. Thousands of miles from home, living on K-rations and cigarettes, confronted every day with the horrors of modern war. GIs were desperate for any link to the land they were fighting for. For many GIs, Coca-Cola was much more than a soft drink. It, it was a symbol of American life. It was a symbol of what they were fighting for. From the earliest days of the war, letters came into the Coca-Cola Company and its bottlers from American troops around the world. If anyone asked us what we're fighting for, we think half of us would answer the right to buy Coca-Cola again. As much as we want. Even a mirage cannot slack our thirst, and we must fall back on those dreams of yesteryear. When we moved up to the soda fountain and sighed contentedly, Cherry Coke, large glass, plenty of ice. Letters like these inspired a legendary decree, credited to Woodruff, that every GI should be able to buy a bottle of Coke for five cents, no matter what it cost the company. It was patriotic, 
It was a wonderful statement and the firm did a lot to make that come true, but it also was a brilliant business decision as well. But there was a problem with that pledge. Bottled Coca-Cola was heavy, bulky and difficult to transport. Arms and vital materiel had priority on supply ships. There was no practical way to get cases of Coke to Anzio, Guadalcanal or North Africa. The solution was daring but simple. Instead of shipping bottles back and forth, take bottling plants to the front lines. The company would deliver entire portable factories to both theaters of the war, set them up near the troops, and bottle coke right there. Now we've got a very risky and costly proposition here because it's expensive to go out into the field, but coke does. It's easy for us in hindsight to say, oh, what a brilliant move that was, but in fact it was a, you know, 